Welcome everybody. My name's David Wood and I chair London Futurists. Today we're going to be hearing about a possible paradigm shift in aging research and our speaker is Dr. Harold Katcher, whose biography really defies any simple description. He <laughs> has done lots of fascinating roles and I think it's fair to say that the total of his work uh, exceeds by some way the simple sum of its parts. So I'm not going to try and talk you through all the ins and outs, although Dr. Katcher himself may refer at times to time to some of the things he's done. It's possible, however, that what he's done in the last year or so will exceed by some way all the previous successes in his career. But in that case, as he will say, it's a uh, extension of many of the ideas that he has been looking at. So I'm referring to the experiments involving the fraction of plasma known as E5, which we're going to be talking about in due course. I might mention that Dr. Katcher has admitted on camera recently he is 77 years old, which is one reason why he's had such a varied career. But I can also tell you that uh, despite being 77, he is still very active, and I got an email from him the other day in which he apologized for not replying earlier to one of my questions, and he says, I'm sorry, I've been working in the lab all day, which is an impressive accomplishment, and so there is still more to be heard. So before I hand over to Dr. Katcher, just a couple of words for me on this notion of paradigm shift. So I've discovered that both Dr. Katcher and myself have a fascination and an interest in the history and philosophy of science. And there is an argument that teaching people the history and philosophy of science might be almost as important as teaching them science. Of course, people need to know the best uh, scientific current theories, but it's also good to understand what makes something a good scientific theory. And the notion of paradigm shift comes in there. This is one of the most famous paradigm shifts. This is how most people throughout most of history conceived of the motion of the heavenly spheres through the skies, with the Earth self-evidently being fixed and immobile at the center, with Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and others revolving around the Earth at the center of everything, a view that was amplified by statements in venerable ancient scripture. Of course, it was more complicated than this. The planets weren't just traveling in circles. They were traveling in circles within circles known as epicycles. From ancient times, at least some people were dissatisfied by that view. In the Islamic times and Arabs, there were some of their thinkers who disliked the idea. But it's mainly Nicholas Copernicus, whose name is associated with this transformation. And he said, no, many things become clearer. Many things become more straightforward once we put the sun at the center of our conceptual universe and recognize the Earth as just one of several planets revolving around the sun. We take this for granted nowadays, but for a while it was controversial. For one, because it wasn't actually as accurate as the old model, because the old model had these circles within circles, epicycles, and the predictions made straightforwardly by Copernicus's system were inaccurate until there were refinements to that initial revolution. And the refinements involved things like changing from circles to ellipses. And when that was done, the new paradigm went from strength to strength. Well, in a similar way, many of us futurists look at the possibility that there should be a Copernican revolution in how we look at aging and diseases. For most of history, people thought, well, there's all these things that can go wrong with the body, such as cancer, heart failures, dementia, stroke, diabetes. In earlier times, of course, lots of uh, infectious diseases as well. And aging, oh yes, that's something else that tends to go wrong with the body, but it's left until last because it's a very natural thing, as natural as the earth being visibly at the center of the universe, uh, it seemed. And aging therefore received a very small share of funding. But the new Copernican revolution says, hang on, it's actually aging that should deserve most of our attention because all these diseases are made more serious by aging. The older we are, the more likely we are to get cancer and the more serious it is likely to be. So that's the second Copernican revolution. But as for the first, 
it needs more details before it actually becomes truly useful. And just saying aging is not enough. We need to answer the question, well, what is aging? And many futurists will probably say, well, aging is damaged molecules and damaged cells, which give rise over time to dysfunctional cell cultures, which damage the organs and later damage whole organ systems. And that is how the body comes to age and grow weak and feeble and eventually die. And if that's the whole truth, then where should we look to address aging? It's at this top level. We should intervene here to try to undo aging. But it's clear that isn't the whole story because as well as molecules and cells being damaged, there are natural repair mechanisms in biology which often result in resetting the ages of cells and uh, dealing in an effective way with damaged molecules. And when the body is young, these natural repair mechanisms are activated and supported. But when the body is old, somehow these mechanisms are hindered and they don't work well. When we see it like this, and this is something I've picked up from reading Dr. Katcher's book, maybe it's more useful to think, well, can we have a different characterization of what's different between a young body and an aging body? And perhaps there, that's where we should be intervening to undo aging. So I'm gonna hand over in a moment to Dr. Katcher. But first, I want to mention one more thing, which is that we have uh, another couple of people on this call too, uh, Nicholas and Nina, who are briefly gonna introduce themselves because they are the publishers of Harold's book and they'll stay in the background, but from time to time, they may offer some uh, thoughts. So just uh, introduce yourselves, please, Nicholas and Nina. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Nina. Uh, I'm Nicholas. And so we, are, we have a publishing house specialized in the rejuvenation field. We even translated David Wood's book, uh, the, the Abolition of Aging, into Portuguese. And now we are uh, the publisher of uh, The Illusion of Knowledge by Dr. Harold Katcher. Yeah, so we will be uh, here in the, in the background, so uh, we maybe make uh, occasional comments uh, uh, according to the, to the presentation and the, and the interview. Thanks so much. So, Harold, uh, over to you. Okay. Uh, to begin with, that, that was a very nice summary you gave and very clever. Um, and and exact, exactly right. It's... it's obvious to everyone who has eyes that the sun revolves around the earth every day. But, and, and to suggest that the sun revolves, excuse me, that the earth revolves around the sun and about its own axis certainly violates one of the basic laws of, of uh, quote, science, the, uh, that the simplest explanation is the, is the most likely one. Here Occam's razor. Occam's razor, thank you. Uh, he, this clearly violates Occam's razor, but it's the truth. The Earth does revolve around its axis, and it does revolve in elliptical orbits around the sun. And aging is not, you know, I, I think the, the major problem with aging, I'll show you my presentation in, in, in but a second. But I think the, the major problem with aging research is that one of the major problems is that people are, are confusing cause and effect. But uh, let's go. Let me, uh, let me start. Uh, paradigm shift in the understanding of aging, and that's, that's what we're talking about. The name of the, of the book, The Illusion of Knowledge, comes from a a quote by Daniel Borstein uh, that's often attributed uh, wrongly, but, but because he said it and agrees to it, uh, Stephen Hawking, I also say it, and I also agree to it, you know, that the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge, that is believing false knowledge. It's quite, quite a thing unlearn uh, something that all authorities agree is truth 
than it is to learn something new. So pretty much because of uh, my strange lifestyle and my not really caring about academic uh, uh, um, credentials, et cetera, and my rise to the top, which really happened anyway, um, I, I didn't care about what people thought. I only cared about the truth. And, and so let, let me tell you kind of, first of all, where we begin. And this is where I began with a complete belief in every one of these things. And, and, and um, oh, what can I say? I, I taught them to my students. I used to teach the biology of aging. So aging results from the accumulation of damage at cellular and higher levels. Damage is the inevitable result of destructive, random, uh, stochastic changes. Aging damage is irreparable, or, or at least there's no time to repair it, particularly damage to the genome, since that's the, the instructions for making everything else, either the nuclear or the mitochondrial uh, DNA, for example. When damage accumulates to, to impede cellular and organismic functioning, this is called aging. So this is what most people call aging, an impaired and dysfunctional body, dysfunctional and impaired cells. Organi this is what everybody believes, pretty much, because there's a whole field called developmental biology, which seems to end at, at adulthood, uh, which is organism development ends at adulthood when deterioration begins so ooh, the assumption is that you reach adulthood you're at your peak and then you start to decline as, as stochastic damages accumulate um, when deterioration becomes severe enough death ensues and organism organismal aging is ultimately the result of cellular aging although that's that's logically i should say uh, aging is, is lo uh, death is logically the result of aging but uh, yeah organismal aging is ultimately the result of cellular aging when cell age the tissues that those are become less functional and the organs that the tissues are part of become less functional and the organ systems, etc. And ultimately the organism becomes dysfunctional and we call that aging. And that's what most people believe, but I don't. Okay, so that, all of those, those points are really what we would call a modern synthesis of aging. This is, this is what most people, including David Sinclair, I believe, believes, but we'll see. Uh, this, this is poorly written, I meant to change it, but Darwin protested that evolution should not be reduced to natural selection, but his protests went unheard. And this is something I, I think you'd agree with. We know from the natural world that, that, that huge cataclysmic events and mass extinctions actually accounted for, for much of the, of the modern world. Okay. Later Darwinism, now this, this is bound to be controversial. Sorry, but it's what I believe. I wrote the book for myself. Later, Darwinism became a pseudo-religion, a secular religion opposed to Christians who attacked it. I think a lot of uh, classical Darwinist attitudes resulted from a, an opposition to, uh, to Christianity and attempt to mechanize the world as, as just to, to rid it of supernatural forces. So. Uh, uh, I hear that the Christians, uh, that a, a common cartoon I've seen in, in I don't know, London Times, a, a famous cartoon from the London Times, 
Starwin is a chimpanzee with the, with the Charles Darwin's face. Uh, you know, nobody would believe we came from such a, a lowly and disgusting creature as, a, as, as an ape. So the voice of authority, the, the people behind the uh, Darwinist movement, uh, I suppose you would say, Reduce Darwinism to a, a mathematical certainty, a survival of the fittest, which I mention is actually a tautology since the fittest mean those most likely to reproduce or produce a reproductive offspring, right? So saying that the, that those that the fittest are are. Uh, uh, are will be more represented in the next generation. This is tautological, which means it gives no actual information. If fittest means means just that. Now I say the the <laughs> classical pseudoscience that calls itself evolutionary theory further shackled itself by not permitting group selection. The the idea that selection could occur between groups or species rather than between individuals. This made the concept of an individual decreasing its lifespan for the good of the species a very impossibility because continued lifespan meant continued reproduction. Continued reproduction meant more offspring, or more offspring meant fitter. Um, Okay, and the uh, deception is, of course, the social insects where the queen provides the uh, genetics for the entire hive. In the late 1800s or early 1900s, August Weismann, who is regarded as one of the greatest uh, biologists of his time, uh, proposed that organisms, in order to make room for their um, evolutionarily advanced offspring, because their, their offspring have had one more round of selection than they have had parents, right? You understand? Uh, so there ought to be a death program to eliminate the parents, which would have, you know, significant advantages over the offspring in terms of, for instance, knowledge or size or, or uh, sheer numbers. Um, it might be, there ought to be a death program to eliminate the parents so that the more involved offspring replace them. And this, this is biology's answer to variation. Uh, Nobody liked this idea at all. The idea that, that we are born to die, that a death program could exist, it was hateful to most biologists. Um, personally, I think for psychological or religious reasons, or anti-religious reasons, rather than, uh, than good science. Um, I think if you look straight on at the, at the, at the at the obvious fact that that species have maximal lifespans, you know that that a a dog will live to twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, but he won't live to twenty five and he won't live to thirty and he won't live to forty or fifty or sixty and and a human has has his own maximum which uh, they say is about one hundred and twenty years so far the 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 uh, highest recorded age, uh, I think it was Jean Calmet, uh, 122 years. And that's, that's about as long as human beings live. And, and uh, let's, let's, let's continue with the, the next slide and I'll, I'll make my points there. So here it says that most scientists, uh, Studying the biology of aging, believe one to all of the following uh, authorities in their quote theories. Those are uh, what are popularly known as sneer quotes. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean to be controversial. I don't, I don't, because because it really bothers me. Uh, a theory is normally the result of of, of a, a bunch of of proven quote proven because you can't prove a hypothesis and hypothesis you can only disprove one, but hypotheses that have never been disproven that explain in general a a, a large phenomenon like like aging. Uh, a real scientific theory should be able to make prediction. And none of these theory, quote theories that make even claim to make predictions. All right, so let, let's let's go let's go through what everyone believes. Uh, first is Peter Miroir. Um, he uh, was a brilliant transplant. He was actually the father of uh, transplantation. So he was a brilliant surgeon and a scientist. And he, uh, upon discovering that as animals age, reproductive rate decreases, came up with, uh, with a theory to explain aging in that mutations that will only appear in old age tend to accumulate because there, there's no selective force against them since reproduction has slowed down at old age and, and, and a gene manifests past production will have no effect on, on whether or not the organism reduces or not. But that involves circular reasoning because then you have to ask yourself, well, why does the organism's reproductive rate taper off as it ages? By the way, that's not true in, in, in many cases. And the naturalists have shown that that's not the case. But, but let's assume that it were the case. The only possible cause for that would be some sort of aging phenomena that slowed down reproduction or stopped reproduction. So now you have to say, well, what's responsible for that phenomenon? And, you, phenomenon? and you'd have to implicate aging genes, which effectively is circular reasoning. You're saying that basically aging is the cause of aging. And, that, and that's, it. there's, again, no information on that. It's, it's, it sounds very clever. It basically means that mutations that affect uh, aging and accumulate totally randomly determine the age that a, that a creature will reach. There's, there's actually no mechanism for, for why these genes will suddenly assert themselves at, at older ages, for example. Uh, Anyway, it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't explain. It doesn't explain the facts. I'll tell you what the facts are in a bit. Okay. Next, there comes George Williams, and he came up with a, a theory which I I never wrote down called antag antagonistic pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is the property of the at that time. Reason this is in 1957 that time recently discovered a, a fact that that one uh, one protein one function is, is not in any way nearly true almost every protein has multiple functions as an involved in multiple systems sometimes the functions are are bizarrely almost scary that a, that a a, a one-dimensional string of amino acids can do such a thing, of course, by folding itself into a three-dimensional machine. An enzyme involved in, in the uh, breakdown of sugar, when it loses the sugar that it breaks down, will actually go to the nucleus, become what's called a transcription factor, and cause the cell to take in more of that sugar. So, I mean, this is a single protein, an unintelligent thing you can, you can write down the structure of on a, on a piece of paper, and, and it'll do these amazing things. 
anyway, uh, George Williams said that a protein that would have a, a pleiotropic form, a form, a Dr. Jekyll form, if you would, during youth so that it, it encourages or increases the ability to reproduce, might then have a pleiotropic form that during aging actually is deleterious, actually harms the animal. But it doesn't matter because that that harmful form occurs after um, reproductive after the reproductive period, so it's totally protected, and and the uh, form that enhances reproduction is selected for, not selected against, even though it it causes aging and death. Uh, my pro my biggest problem with this is that. I don't believe there are such uh, such proteins. They they give examples. Uh, if you read my book, I I explain uh, I explain why the examples they give are, are totally fallacious and don't and actually don't prove their point prove the opposite point. In fact, it assumes that. Uh, that uh, genes act deleteriously, and then I have switch genes because I cannot name any. They talk about mTOR. Uh, I go into it in the book. I, we have limited time now. Soon my genes uh, at the end of life would be immune from selection, the old Medawar hypothesis. The, again, an, uh, an odd thing about that is at what point does an enzyme switch from its Dr. Jekyll face to its, to its Mr. Hyde face? At what point does it become deleterious? Why does it, why does it become deleterious at that point? There's just an absolutely no explanation for that. It's, it, it's pretty pointless. Is it a random change? Does, does it occur because of some other changes associated with aging, and in which case it's not what it what it's said to be. All right, well, let's leave leave that aside, and uh, we'll then go to uh, to a man who worked for, actually preceded uh, George Williams. This is Den Denham Harmon. Denham Harmon was an engineer. He's an electrical engineer, I believe, and he. Uh, he believed he understood what caused aging. It, it wasn't some mysterious change of a protein from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. He believed it was the accumulation of damage caused by the natural high energy particles present in the environment. Uh, he, he knew that these were produced externally Cosmic radiation was a big thing at that time, as I recall. Um, and he knew they were internally, although now we know much more about the internal action of reactive oxygen species, etc. But my only objection to that is his experiments. He tried to uh, he tried being animals and cells in in uh, high radiation environments and found there was some sort of resemblance to natural aging, not a very good resemblance. And um, he didn't know that cells had natural repair systems to correct mistakes in DNA. Even some, some apparently immutable mistake could be corrected with a fair degree of accuracy. Okay. Thomas Kirkwood, who is presently uh, a well-known uh, proponent of, of his own disposable aging theory and a pretty much a, pretty much composes the editorial board of many publications devoted to aging, uh, not composes entirely, is, is on. Uh, Thomas Kirkwood's theory of disposable stoma 
basically is this. Uh, nature has limited energy. Organisms in nature have limited energy. And nature cares nothing about the individual. It cares about the species. So, geez. so an organism will uh, reserve that limited energy for perfect repair of its germline cells, while its somatic cells, its body cells, are ultimately disposable. They're essentially like a fellow who wrote the selfish gene said. Uh, the body, the body is basically a mule designed to carry a, to carry a genes. Uh, so th that's the basic view. I, I say that's a sort of group selection on a micro scale. The cells giving giving up their perfect rear to the germline cells, uh, sacrificing their own lives for 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 other cells. Uh, it's very clear that living animals have more than enough energy uh, for reproduction, uh, avoid predators, etc., including play and, and, and activities that make no sense if they don't have the energy to, to produce a few reparative enzymes, which don't take very much energy whatsoever. Uh, the, the number of genes that change with aging is very small, a very small proportion of the, of the, of the total genome. Uh, and he's also wrong about the, the perfect group of germline cells because recent work within the last month has shown that early embryos have the same epigenetic ages as, as their mothers do until it's gastrulation where there is a, an actual rejuvenation process, which at the very least resets their age clock. Uh, we're talking about their DNA methylation age clock as, as per uh, Adam Levine or, or uh, my favorite, Steve Horvath. Uh, um, sets their rejuvenation clock back to zero. Does it also repair all their damages? We know that a highly defective uh, mother yeast cell with all kinds of lesions in her DNA will pr produce perfect offspring. Uh, how good is this repair process? How perfect is it? it? It apparently is good enough to last for generations. Um, Further experimental work in mice and, and, lower, and lower mammals shows that there are a whole bunch of enzymes and uh, important factors that are reduced during aging, actually, and even more that are increased during aging, particularly among microRNAs. What I'm trying to say is that we know that there are changes in the transcriptional and translational profile of cells with age. A translational transcriptional profile is basically the age phenotype of the cell. Now, uh, I just put this in at the last moment because I really didn't know much about David Sinclair's theory of aging. I know David Sinclair. I, I was very delighted with his, his review of my uh, my bio uh, archive, uh, I can't call it pre-publication, pre-print. Um, but basically, he seems to be a believer in the same sort of stochastic random damage uh, uh, theory that, that everybody else believes in, except he's switched from the damages occurring to nuclear DNA, you know, because we found just aren't, aren't damages in nuclear DNA, certainly not enough to cause the aging phenomena, to mitochondrial DNA. Yeah, there, there's a high source of reactive oxygen species. They're, they're, it, should be, uh, it should be easily mutable. 
but it, that doesn't seem to be the case either. So he, he has shifted to a, somehow a loss of epigenetic information. This is, this is his information theory of aging, that basically genes don't change. It's the somatic mutation theory of aging, that genes don't change with aging, but their epigenetic control of genes changes or becomes lost with aging. So this is another uh, wear and tear, except the wear and tear is on the epigenome or in the genome. Uh, what he does have is a, is a, uh, a working plan for uh, which he is economically involved in for, uh, for treating aging, which involves uh, rapamycin, uh, metformin, and uh, most notably MNN, uh, mononu uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, uh, which is a precursor to NAD+. And the basic, uh, the basic theory is that we keep on losing, not it's a fact, we keep on losing NAD+, as we age. It starts accumulating in reduced form in the mitochondrion, and its cousin, which exists in the cytoplasm called NADP plus, uh, is present abundantly, but it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help the uh, the, uh, the mitochondrion. In fact, what's missing there is the reduced form NADPH which is actually a strong reducing agent which counteracts the damage that oxygen does to, to a cell. Okay, where am I? So uh, here's a very prejudiced slide. It's the pros and cons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ask me, David. Um, the pros and cons of program versus stochastic theories of aging. Pros. Stochastic theories of aging, they're easy to understand. The new car to jalopy model explains it all. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, program theories explain species life and the mechanisms that they deliberately limit them. Uh, explain a lot more than that. As, as I'll in a second. For now, I'll tell you right this second. There's a, in all terrestrial vertebrate uh, genera, uh, classes rather, mammals, uh, birds, amphibians, reptiles, uh, there is a definite relationship between the time from conception to sexual maturity and lifespan. Now, that, according to, to uh, David Fells, the naturalist, is because uh, lifespan is, well, he says that lifespan is related to predation rate, which is, which is uh, statistically a fact. And, but he can't understand how lifespan length go back, goes back and influences the time uh, period from conception to, uh, to sexual maturity. But I believe that, uh, that I can. Okay. Uh, cons, stochastic theories. Please note that none of these th theories predict species maximal lifespans. There's, 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 there's no way to predict it if it's basically a series of random events or how lifespan is related to ecological niche, which it is. Uh, all of these theories assume the so-called hallmarks of aging. This is a, a, a very famous uh, paper by, by uh, Louis Autin that, uh, that pretty much all, all people in the biology of aging subscribe to. And the hallmarks are aging are very explicitly 
dedicated or devoted or directed to cellular aging. So the basic theory is that cellular aging is the basis of aging. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. None of these theories explains the relation of, uh, of uh, time from fertilization to sexual maturity to the lifespan of the animal or the way that, the, that predation determines lifespan and hence the length of time until sexual maturity. As will be discussed, maximum or average lifespan is a function of time to maturity. In, in mammals, it's a function that involves an exponential term. In, in, uh, in other orders, in other classes of terrestrial vertebrates, it's often just a multiplication factor. You multiply the time until sexual maturity by, the, uh, by, by this factor to get the total lifespan. Uh, and it works short lifespan and long lifespan. Uh, all right. I don't, I don't mean to bore you. Uh, here's something not boring. Uh, quote from the Bible. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And alternatively, a quote from, uh, from a movie I watched as a kid, uh, Dracula, uh, with Boris Karloff, uh, the blood is the life. And uh, next to that is uh, Nature, uh, volume 433, 17 February uh, 2005. Rejuvenation of age progenitor cells by exposure to a young systemic environment. Now, this is a paper that to me changed everything and I believe should change the paradigm of aging completely. Let's, uh, let's see what the next slide looks like and perhaps I'll put you back. It's, it's really pretty horrible. Uh, here on, on the left, we're showing basically the process of parabiosis. Now, parabiosis is a process by which two animals are wounded and stitched together in such a manner that they share a common circulatory system. It's a, I, I can't imagine what ethics committee would, would allow such an experiment to be performed. We're interested in what we call heterochronic parabiosis, where the two uh, rats sewn together are of different ages, one young, one old. Uh, often the old rat will bite off the head of the young rat, killing the young rat and itself, <laughs> since they have joint circulations. Uh, it, it's a pretty cruel procedure. It was... Uh, I can't remember, it was first thought of in the 1800s. By 1940, McKay used it to try, we used heterochronic parabiosis. Clive McKay, the guy who discovered that uh, calorie restriction increased lifespan, uh, he, he tried this procedure, heterochronic parabiosis on young and old rats, and he reached the conclusion that, uh, that the old rats were eaten by the parabiotic treatment in that when he dissected them, he found that their, their connective tissues were white instead of yellow and their, their flesh was, was easy to cut through instead of hard like the flesh of older animals. If anybody's eaten an old chicken, they know what I mean. Uh, so that was not really great evidence. Uh, Ludwig, uh, in the 1940s, uh, tried the same experiment and discovered that he could increase the maximal lifespan of the old rats by something like 20%. Now, this is pretty amazing when you think about it, but one could easily explain it by, by, by a much simpler hypothesis. One could simply say that the, uh, 
the functions of the uh, old rat were taken over by the organs of the young rat, uh, excretion by the young rat's kidneys, and etc. Uh, so it was when the Stanford group investigated parabiosis and found that the environment actually changed the aging characteristic of cells, in this case, progenitor cells, which are basically stem cells that only produce uh, one or two sorts of uh, offspring instead of a multitude. They have a very low potency, as they say. Um, suddenly, that really changed my whole idea of, uh, of aging. Uh, I looked back to other experiments where they did tissue transplantations between young and old animals and, and et cetera, and found that while if, if it were the case that aging were a result of irreversible damage accumulated by a cell during its course of its lifetime, then if you took old cells and put them into a young body and asked them to form a, uh, a, um, a tissue uh, to heal a wound, you would expect that the old cells would fail because they just don't have what it takes to, to reproduce quickly enough and, and, and survive the, the conditions of transplantation, et cetera. And if you took young cells and put them in an old body, why those young cells are vigorous and full of activity, well, they'll certainly make a, a much stronger uh, uh, joint adhesion, wound repair, et cetera, than the old cells will. But in fact, the opposite is the truth. Old cells placed in a young body become active, are able to, to, to form uh, uh, grafts and, and, uh, and are able to form viable transplants. While, while young cells put in an old body basically become old and uh, viable, etc. So, this is. Later on, uh, the Stanford group went on, the individual members thereof, Tom Rando, the Conboys, uh, not Irv Weissman, Amy Winters, yes, went on to, to do further work in parabiosis. Uh, and she was joined apparently at Harvard uh, by, by, um, Saul Valeda, who used parabiosis to show that improved uh, the mental functioning of, of, uh, of old rats. They, they became uh, normal uh, in terms of their ability to, they became normal young rats in terms of their ability to learn. Uh, so, Later, later studies show that just about every, every uh, reproducing tissue uh, was, was rejuvenated by young plasma, or by the components of young plasma. The convoys went a little further uh, to show that, in fact, there was no cellular contribution by the blood, blood cells to to uh to the new grass and and etc anyway so uh the shift the paradigm shift would is uh, at least in part simply that instead of the aging cell producing the aging body that is, instead of cell aging resulting from cellular aging, the aging body produces the aging cell. Or more accurately, it produces the cell's aging phenotype. And then, then the rest talks about the illustrations on the left. So 
what I'm saying, which is demonstrated in convoys, by Valeda, by, by wagers, by Rando, although they never say it, is that the cellular aging phenotype is mutable. It's changeable. We can bring it back. We can bring it back to uh, to uh, youthful to the youthful phenotype because it's controlled somehow by blood and specifically by the blood plasma. So, so this is my tension. A life is a four-dimensional object that unfolds over time. Of course, it unfolds over time. But, you know, if cellular aging is a result of accumulated damage, and if the cell age phenotype that results from accumulated damage is controlled by the body, then the damage isn't random. This, this to me, seems, seems very clear. Uh, that means that both life stages and the rate of duration are fuzzily determined. Now, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Cellular age phenotype is controllable by factors in the blood plasma, which means that cellular aging is a myth. There's a, there's a periodical called the aging cell. I said there is no aging cell, that there are cells that are extracted from old people, you know, all the, the characteristics of, quote, aging cells, including heterochromatin and, and mitochondrial inefficiency and ROS production and, and a different set of, uh, of uh, transcriptions, translation products. But if you take that same cell and put it in the proper environment, it will change so that it now has a phenotype appropriate to that environment. Okay. The question remains as to whether it is pro-aging factors in old blood or pro-youth factors in young blood uh, or a combination that results in, in cellular age age. Our own experiments show pro-youth factors can reverse cellular age phenotype, including the Horvath clocks, the epigenetic age signature of cells. So, uh, it doesn't answer the question. The, the convoys try to answer that question, work together with um, Dobry Kiparov, uh, by diluting plasma in half with a, with a solution consisting of, uh, of alien and, and off-the-shelf young uh, serum albumin, human serum albumin. And they showed that there was apparent rejuvenation in tissues. They never showed a Horvath clot. They never told how long this rejuvenation lasted. But there did seem to be rejuvenation. I've seen it uh, replicated by some Chinese work recently. Uh, but uh, another Chinese work said that, showed in fact, that young serum albumin is a pro youthful factor. This is what Darby Kiprov originally believed. And so, I would say at point, the experiment is inconclusive, showing that that, it, that it's uh, that it's exclusively pro-aging factors that accumulate in the blood. To me, that that's an, another extension of the wear and tear theory of aging. Uh, I know we know that there are youthful features that exist in the blood that promote youth, and and our experiments have shown. We have reduced age by 54%. We have reduced uh, old rats to young rats, young adult rats, not, not, uh, not children, not cubs, I guess they call them. 
which means that cellular aging is a myth. The cell's apparent age, its age phenotype is determined by its environment, not by its history. Okay. So, what does life, real life, say about aging? So I'm saying, you know, to me, this is amazing. We're basing our theory of aging on, on, on a simplified version of Darwin and holding that as a Bible, as a, a mathematically precise discipline in, in order to, to evaluate our theories of aging. You know, I think we should evaluate our theories of evolution and leave aging to, to experimental verification. And, and that's what I've done. I've looked at those instances where aging has been reversed. And uh, I connected a few dots. Okay. So the real answers to lifespan and aging are not to be found within the thin volume of Darwinian evolution, but in the natural world. After examining hundreds of genera and th uh, of terrestrial vertebrates, thousands of species, the eminent naturalist David Rickfeld's, Rick Lefts, concluded, thus, no single pattern of life Development, maturity, aging varies among vertebrate species only by expansion or contraction of a common time scale. So I say, the meaning of this is clear. The life histories of all terrestrial vertebrates are similar in all, the shape of their lives. And, and at this point, I, I realize what I neglected, you know, we look at human development. We, we see prenatal development. It goes embryo, zygote to embryo to fetus, to neonate to, to et cetera. We go to toddler to school child, preteen to, to, to adolescent, and then to adulthood. And then synthesis, and then it stops as far as, as, far as development is concerned. It goes from young adulthood to middle age and to old age. And I suppose you can divide each of those periods into early, late, and middle. But they exist. And the fact that they exist is that we can recognize them. And, and, the, and the fact that, that such phenomenon as pattern occurs means that these genes are manifesting themselves after re reproductive life. But, that, but that's all right. Um, the point is that all mammals basically have the same life to sexual maturity, then finding a mate, raising a family, or, or taking care of your herd, depend, depending on whether you're male or female, uh, um, eventually giving in to old age and allowing the, the, uh, the strongest competitor to, de to defeat you, handing over your role, as it were. We all have the same pattern. The only difference is the rate at which it occurs. In a mouse, the entire, the entire all the stages occur in the space of three to four years. In a human, it, all the stages occur in the space of 120 years, but as we age, our probability of death in, increases exponentially. So, there are very, very few of us ever reach the the maximal possibility of our our our, uh, our lifespan. Though we do see at the very end of lifespan, those individuals who make it to the very the very maximal seem to stop aging. We, we see this all the time. Nobody has an explanation. See, it's just that the aging program has run out. There's nowhere to go. At that point, we, we just continue as we are. Okay. Uh, the biologist, and uh, apologize for mispronouncing his name, João Pedro de Magalhães, 
I, I, I've written to him. So a firm believer, I've communicated with him, in, in the modern synthesis states that after examining the literature of terrestrial species, and he did a, you know, a meta-analysis involving lots and lots of papers, overall, these results indicate that independently of body size, the vent developmental time is strongly associated with maximum adult lifespan. Developmental time, the time to sexual maturity is strongly associated with maximum adult lifespan. And by the way, maximum adult lifespan is strongly associated with, uh, with the average adult lifespan. It's a, you know, a fraction. What I try to do and what I told people in my, uh, my, my uh, 2013 paper was what I called heterochronic plasma exchange, HPE. I figured that was nice commercially because it could spell hope or it could spell hype, <laughs> depending on your take. Um, but the idea was some of this, whether the convoys are, are correct or not, whether, uh, whether it's a case of both youth and promote factors and age promoting factors, uh, if you completely replace the plasma of an old person, with the plasma of a young person, you should be able to change that young person's cells age phenotype. I figured, figured, asked, if you did it enough times, you could do it, it would permanently revert. Now, fortunately, we were not able to do that. <laughs> we tried every which way. We had, we had people in Germany who supposedly had done that, had, had uh, done plasma change with rats. We picked rats because they have relatively large veins. Mice are, are just too small. Uh, so we tried everything, and we even tried manual, manual plasma exchange, extract blood, centrifuge it down, exchange it with young plasma, uh, re-inject it. The rats' veins wouldn't take such uh, abusive treatment. So, uh, so at that point, I, this was in Mumbai. Mumbai, India, at NMMIMS University, which has a, a known school of pharmacology and a known school of business. Um, in any case, I, I only had e visas at that time, which gave me two months' stay, and I had to leave. And I knew if I left, I'd be leaving without results, I'd probably not be coming back. And honestly, that was kind of a relief. <laughs> uh, but in any way, I said, let's try it. Let's try one last thing. I really read all the literature I could uh, on this subject. I'm not sure of what to say. Uh, I connected a few dots that, that to me were very obvious and, and, and apparent, but nobody had ever mentioned them except in passing. Uh, and I said, I think I you know how, how to extract that fraction of blood which, which contains um, what we now call E5, the youth promoting fraction of blood. Now it was a guess. It was a guess and 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 a guess. All together. Each, each one with a small probability. So when I got home from home from uh, India, it was really good to see my wife and family, etc. And I honestly expected that was it. Actually, I'll say, well, we tried. 
Uh, Akshay, by the way, uh, sponsors all of this and is uh, a financier and a biologist in his own right, although self-taught. Uh, and I was not totally unhappy because at that time I was 72 years old and, and uh, or, or more. Uh, and traveling was very difficult for me. Just walking the gangplank, uh, just walking in line through customs was, was like a, a real effort for every foot. I had a move was 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 painful every every step rather, but I wanted to see it happen anyway. So uh, just telling you I was pleased about not going. All right, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. What, what can I do? I tried my best, um, but then I got a, an email from Kavita that it works, and. This was the first, our first try. So what I had done is, is that we extracted that fraction of plasma that I thought would contain uh, the pro youthful factors. I, I can't do much more than that except we injected it into rats, uh, into their tail lanes. Um, Strata's really excellent at that. She is really excellent. Um, thank, thank my laboratory skills are, so, are, are somewhat lacking, but but not my inventiveness in the laboratory at least. So that's so that's good. So here here we can see uh, we look at the first graph and we see uh, grip strength. This is in Newtons and Newtons about a quarter of a pound. Uh, so on a day, we have blue represents the old control. The middle represents the young, the old treated, and the the gray bar represents the young control. And uh, you actually do see a slight increase in, in strength among in the young control, but we see an enormous increase in strength in the in the uh, old treated animal to the extent that at one point it even surpasses the young control and and in uh, and certainly overlaps the young controls if you look at the error bars and no overlap whatever with the old control uh, so this was uh, was a little bit encouraging and uh, actually forced me to go back to India. The next slide, slide shows, this is a normal human blood panel, uh, except a rat. Uh, so we look at bilirubin uh, measure of, uh, of, um, of uh, the gallbladder or, uh, or the destruction of hemoglobin, gall, we look at liver enzymes, we look at triglycerides, we look at high density lipoproteins, cholesterol, glucose, creatine, uh, blood, urea, and nitrogen. That's what that stands for. It's a um, function of, uh, that's a, a variable fit kidney functioning and total protein. Uh, and we see in almost every case, not in almost every case, in every case, that the, the uh, old experimental animal becomes just like the young troll, uh, which make, which again, a reemphasizes the, uh, the nature of life as, as a transition of, of life stages. Uh, they have, reassumed the phenotype appropriate to their epigenetic age, as far as I'm concerned. Or, uh, you know, you can read the book, read the original paper. There's much more on this. For instance, for me, what's particularly important uh, is, is the, uh, 
the amount of reduced glutathione present in organs. Uh, glutathione is an antioxidant, it's very, very important in combating oxygen damage due to uh, uh, mitochondrial respiration. Um, what, what we see is, is just that, that we get back in all aspects to a, a life stage resembling or, or identical to that of youth and every aspect tested. And these are a lot of different, uh, lot of different tests. We have more, we have many more tests. And, and of course, the paper in the book it shows tests, cognitive tests. Uh, let's let's see. Our second try shows that. With our first try, we sacrifice the animals after 30 days. With our second try, we're going to do the same thing to repeat it and said, no, let these animals live, at least for another 30 days. And uh, so one month, two months, and you can see well, what you're looking at here is uh, days post treatment on the on the horizontal axis, and latency quote on the on the vertical axis. Latency means the time it takes for the rat to solve a maze. This is called a Barnes maze. It's just a big table with circular holes cut or cut out or along the periphery, one of which has a pouch, rest of which lead to a big drop to the floor which rats won't take. Uh, so they search around for the for the one with the pouch and we're given we give the visual cues. In any case, uh, we can see a continual improvement in the rats. I think uh, what we see over here in the third month, and this is this is this is past second injection. The second injection occurred at day ninety-five. Well, let me see. The second injection occurred at day ninety-five. So the third month is, is is past their their second rejuvenation set. It's a set of four injections. Injections, nothing more than that. And uh, and we can see that at time zero. Where, uh, where originally the old rats would just sit there in the middle of the table with a confused look on their faces, they uh, kind of got the idea much more quickly to try to 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 find their way to a to a hole. They're also much larger, by the way. These are male rats. Male rats grow to be about twice the the. Uh, Eight month old rats were about twice the size of the, of the uh, five months old rats. So, uh, any case, uh, there's a lot more to this can try as uh, see. Uh, some very exciting things, like for instance, cytokines uh, being repressed to below youthful levels. And uh, lastly, I just want to conclude by saying. Uh, due to the uh, beneficence of, of uh, B.A. Comel uh, of Belgium, we were given given some some money to uh, to do longevity experiments. Longevity wasn't our aim because the FDA couldn't care about longevity, and we want to become commercial. Uh, so. For instance, the increase in grip strength is a good indication that maybe frailty should be our first target. As it's a, a low-hanging fruit, there's absolutely, it's absolutely universal and there's absolutely no cure for it. This one is, is labeled. Uh, and I wanted, to, I wanted everyone to see this. One, we see that after the third dose, the grip strength remains at a, at a a high level, at least twice that of the, of the uh, old control. And I wanted it to, you to see that there was basically no change in body weight. This is something that, that bothered Akshay. He, he thought that 
young rats should be should be uh, slim. I said, well, why should the growth rate change? I think actually was right in this case. Because towards the end of the experiment, after the third dose, we begin to see that, one, the body weight decreases only slightly, but decreases while the strength increases considerably. And we can see that you know, by, by comparing these two. And what might the result of that be? And that, that's the next slide. This is, uh, I just, just wanted to point out first that the C stands for control and the T stands for treated. And even this uh, still photo, I think you can see the difference between the two animals. The treated animal is longer and sleeker. Now, I must admit that this is a particularly good example. And in at least one case, the control seems seen better than, but this is a normal example. This is the more usual and typical example of, of, of uh, treated versus controlled rats. They're put in the same box just for display. So let's watch their video and, and see if we can see a difference. And that's about it, folks. So we saw the treated rat uh, with much more vigor and much more vitality in that particular uh, case. I would say so. Also slimmer and uh, sexier, <laughs> if you're into rats. Uh, <laughs> but there are many other metrics as well. Shapelier. And there are many other metrics as well. Yes. yes. So how is NAB? Non-invasive non metrics, of course. Our choice of inflammatory cytokines and, and uh, such like things, things that you can easily measure in the blood. So the actual uh, flies, plasma fraction, E5, is uh, mm. commercially sensitive. And so you're not publishing, for the time being, the details of that. For the time being, yes. But would it be possible for somebody else to try and repeat the experiments that you and your team have done? We because plan to, that's what we, science we, is about, isn't it? Course, so science is about course. other people replicating it. Exactly. I, I would not trust anything unless it could be replicated. And it isn't science unless it can be replicated. And I, I don't really blame people for holding off on, on, on their judgment until we've replicated it. But because we feel certain we can, we, we say that. Um, we certainly have intentions in the future of uh, human, uh, dog, non-human primate, and further CRO, uh, you know, a certified research organization or, or commercial research organization. Uh, certifying all of our results. Some of our results actually are already certified uh, in, in our uh, papers. A lot of our uh, organ levels of, uh, of antioxidants are, are, are determined, have, were determined by private labs. How do you envision the tests working in the case of humans? When the rats are being injected, what, every 90 days? So with humans, how would it work? And what effects do you well, imagine uh, you'll see? I mean, that, that's, of course, is the question. What we have seen is, is, <laughs> is what I would call a Benjamin Button effect, which is that the older the rats get, the younger they, they uh, appear or the younger their, their biological age. So it takes time for the effect to occur. How much time? I can't say. Uh, Akshay is the optimist. He thinks it'll take as long as it does on rats. I'm uh, optimistic in a different way. I believe it will reset the age 
especially after the second set of uh, rejuvenations. It'll reset the age eventually, and, and it may take years to, to, to the young adult stage. You'll be growing younger instead of older is how I envision it. And because it might people, take years. People complain that it might take years. And I said, oh, would you really mind growing younger every day for years? Because it might take a long time in the human case, I can see it makes sense to try some intermediate species such as uh, dogs. Yeah. So what... what Time scales do you have in mind when some of these other experiments might be done? And what's the constraint? What's, what's limiting uh, more people the, doing more work on this? The, limit, the limitation at this point, which we hope won't be a limitation for very long, is uh, amount. Amount of E5. Yes. Our, our, our major purpose in the United States is to increase and to, to useful values for people, scaling up, as it were. So some people may imagine that you get E5 by blood transfusion from young people and removing stuff. Other people no. may imagine you create them all from a, a, a small number of biochemicals. I, I don't really don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Sorry. That's fair. Uh, it's, it's, I thought I would ask. <laughs> no, fair. You can always ask. Right. Okay. And uh, I, we we're actually already going 90 minutes. So normally I would shut down these meetings by now, but you had such a lot of interesting things that I let you keep talking. So maybe we'll, well keep going with you. questions for a bit longer. I will uh, pick out some questions from the audience too. If the audience members uh, upvote to help me pick out which of the questions uh, uh, are more appropriate than others. In the meantime, I, I will ask one more myself, which is, you had this nice slide of two different theories of aging, the stochastic theories of aging versus the program theory of age. Basically, you believe that somehow for the good of the species, as it were, uh, there is a program that applies which will cause us to eventually uh, grow old and leave space for our uh, uh, descendants who might vary from us. And you said, well, one of the drawbacks of the program theory, and you said, well, there are none. But I guess people will ask <laughs> two, about two drawbacks. They'll ask, first of all, well, where does this program operate? Can they see the program? No. I don't know. We don't know. So that makes it a still I a mean, bit of a mystery, because people oh, can yeah, see well, the damage I, accumulating. I, again, I, I've said before, I, I think we've uncovered a new continent, and we We've seen some of the taller peaks, but there's a vast amount to yet be explored. Yeah, I don't know where it comes from. Is it the hypothalamus, the, the, the superchiasmic nucleus that, the, that, that regulates everything? I, I don't know. But you think it's to do with the blood in particular? The blood oh, is I, the... Know it's, I know it's to do with the blood. <laughs> So why aren't more people in the rejuvenation community jumping up and down about this? Why aren't they saying this is, is it because, because of this? Because they don't believe it. I think it's that simple. They don't believe the experiments will be repeated or they don't believe the theories that you have adv ad advocated? I don't think anybody's heard those theories until very recently. Uh, I got some, some very positive feedback uh, from, from eminent theorists on it. So, uh, uh, including, can I mention his name, Nicholas? Yes, Steve Horvath, uh, the, the inventor of the uh, Horvath clock, very well known uh, scientist, I, and, and from actually from many people, I, I've gotten. Uh, so the theory, I believe, is correct. Uh, I haven't heard anybody uh, offer any, any uh, logical objection to it or to anything I've said. Well, the other uh, logical objection is on the notion of a uh, group selection, because people mm. will say, if something's for the good of the group, 
if animals have to behave in some kind of self-sacrificing way for the for, uh, for the group to benefit, what prevents free riders? You know, this is the guy who oh, yeah. benefits from the group as a whole, but the, that guy is more selfish than the others. What's going to prevent the evolution of that individual trait uh, and damage the, the group trait? And this is the classic argument against group selection. Yeah, correct. That's against group selection is classically conceived. Uh, but group selection, by my broader definition, is the elimination of an entire species uh, by, for instance, invading species, climactic conditions, etc., where whole groups replace other groups based on their superiority under changing conditions. Let's so I, 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 have, I have no argument with the... With, with, the, that sort of Talmudic logic. Well, people will say that it might be for the good for the species that all individuals grow old and die, but if there was a genetic variation that allowed them to not grow old and die, then, and they pass that on to their uh, descendants, then that right. would dominate. And so the ones that grew old Correct. and die Correct. would die, and the ones who live longer would live longer. So, but the, the fact is that the the population uh, lifespan is largely determined by predation. Uh, so that argument really doesn't hold when you when you throw predation into into the picture. If they're going to be eaten, they're going to be eaten. I, I guess there's the other argument. Doesn't doesn't matter what they're whether they'll live to be a thousand or not. If they'll be eaten by the time they're two. There's the other argument that a group that can also fight against free riders, as we humans do, we've got we've got sensibilities to not uh, not uh, tolerate uh, selfish individuals in our midst, and yes. this seems to apply up and down the biological level too. That group selection can still make sense, provided these other mechanisms are in place at the same time. That's correct. Nobody seems to consider the fact that that often organisms cooperate with each other to, to, to produce a common effect that's, that's greater than, than, uh, than the organisms by themselves. Like for instance, uh, wrasse fish that clean other fish. Uh, by the way, those are the, you know, you know the cleaner wrasse, W-R-A-S-S-E? They, they, follow, they follow other fish and take the parasites off them. Uh, for example, other fish come to their cleaning stations to, to be cleaned, in, 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 in fact. So, so there are cooperations in nature, too. It's, it's not all uh, red and, and tooth and claw. Uh, a question from Didier Cornell. He actually has a few questions. Uh, first is, mm. why don't you give the information to everybody? If it's working, people will give you lots of money and fame. <laughs> I, I have an obligation to Akshay and the shareholders and, and, and everybody I promised. I, I keep my promises. That's, that's the way it is. So in that case, uh, Didier's next question is, well, how long until the patent will be available and you are able to talk? Is this years, decades? Oh, God forbid. I, I, I'm 77 years old. I have my own shelf life. <laughs> I, I want to get it uh, done as, as soon as, as possible, but uh, I have no idea. Let, let Didier speak to uh, in the next two years. Maybe. Okay. People have questions about other ways in which the body might be prompted to rejuvenate itself. For example, Brian mm -hmm. from Canada uh, talks about his own experience with water fasts. Uh, and he says it's only N equals one, but there does seem to be some literature that uh, the no, body no, can be no, no. Hmm? Absolutely, absolutely correct. Uh, absolutely been shown that epigenetic age is changed by uh, exercise and, uh, and, and diet. So how, the effects that you expect from E5, how will they compare with the effects of what we can do by 
diet and by exercise and so on? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm 77 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty strong. I, I actually went to the gym yesterday. But I can walk 15 minutes and I'm dead. I, I remember when I thought that I could walk forever. <laughs> I used to walk from lower Manhattan to the Bronx where I lived. Uh, uh, um, to get back that energy and, and, and not to mention all the uh, sensory deprivation that occurs. Uh, my hearing is poor. My, my vision is actually better than it's ever been since I had my, uh, my lenses replaced with artificial lenses. <laughs> um, um, but so these other mechanisms can give some rejuvenation, but uh, limited. No, we, we, we plan, you know, our rejuvenation occurs at the cellular level, at the, at the heart of the cell, at the, at the, uh, at the cell's DNA. At the, at the epigenetic level, I mean, this is this is, for instance, what uh, what um, David Sinclair is trying to do reprogram it. As far as we're concerned, we discovered nature's way of of, of reprogramming cells. Uh, David Sinclair is looking at a different mechanism using three of the four Yamanaka factors. Correct. Uh, OKS, so yes. called which uh, seem to be remarkable. But as you yeah. said, maybe it's not what nature has uh, already provided. Right. We, we, we still to see it in whole organism. We still to see if it prevents teratoma formation, etc. And ultimately, our way is better. <laughs> yes. I'm going to take one more question just now from the audience. Then I'm going to pass the microphone after you've answered it, Carla, I'll pass it to Nicholas and uh, Nina because they've been listening very thoughtfully. I'm sure they've got some comments or questions, but let's take this question first from Steve Buss, who is an aging researcher who says that uh, the articles you published in 2015 or so are remarkable and changed his own perspective. So he's been following uh -huh. you for a while. Thank you. He asks a fairly technical question. He talks about JMJD3 a demethylator of uh, another bigger chemical, H3K27ME3. So H3K27ME3 sure. is the uh, uh, the marker of the polycomb uh, restriction apparatus. Yep. When when that when that that that's one of the amino acid residues in the histone proteins that DNA is wrapped around. And when that particular configuration exists, that means that this DNA should not be touched, should not be fixed, should not be transcribed. It's, a, it's kind of a stop signal. It's a repressive signal. Uh, but go well, ahead. <laughs> so I'm glad uh, you, you know what that means, because um, yeah. Steve says, uh, wouldn't a good way to achieve the rejuvenation you talk about be to increase JMJD3, this demethylator? And he says can, there are various, various things you can, can do that. try it. <laughs> so he can try it, but you've already found something that uh, is working. And so... Yeah, uh, we're, 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 we're not going to go off in, in different directions at this point. <laughs> we're, we're pretty focused. So there's a research program there that you are basically supportive of, but you're not going to do it yourself because, yeah, you need to focus. Absolutely. Yeah, Exactly. So, Nicholas and uh, Nina, the publishers of Harold's book, uh, what comments would you like to add or questions would you like to pose to Harold? Well, um, I'd like to comment about, uh, you asked it, uh, why aren't other people from the rejuvenation field as excited um, mm. about this matter? And I think one of the, the matters is that it is a paradigm shift and all paradigm shifts are hard <laughs> and people uh, tend to, right. to take a long time to, to d jump on board. And typically, typically, they say the uh, older generation has to die out before the new paradigm uh, gains acceptance. I can't yeah. wait for that. <laughs> Let's hope that that doesn't happen. <laughs> but 
And another thing is that um, Harold defends the programmed aging paradigm. And this is something that uh, a lot of people, I feel personally, this is my opinion, people are kind of afraid of thinking about that because if yes. aging is programmed, then you exactly. can change it. But exactly. Harold, is, yeah, Harold is trying to Your show book. that even if it's programmed, it can be changed. Yeah. And I, uh, the, thank you, Nina. That, that's a point I, I, I make in the book. It's one of my my few witticisms. Or, or, uh, um, basically, uh, people have been afraid to look at the programmed aging. That, that, that's originally what stopped uh, August Weissman's theory back of back at the turn of the 20th century uh, you know if if program is if aging is programmed if life is a program then your death is inevitable uh sometimes the best thing to do is to confront your worst fears and you often find solutions when you do so and that's really what what i did you know, because the fact that, that that lifespan is programmed, I think is obvious to anybody who, who looks at animal lifespans in, 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 the, in the natural world. But, but just the very concept, oh my gosh, our death is fixed, immutable. We're, we're four-dimensional objects with a beginning and an end. It's, it's just too scary to contemplate. But once you do contemplate it and realize the mechanisms behind it, it can actually be changed. Yeah. And another thing like um, that people aren't like 100% uh, on board. I'm also not 100% on board. I believe in, in Harold. I believe in his experiments. But uh, as anyone who knows science, there needs to be more experiments, more results and everything else. So uh, I'm excited about this research. I support Harold. I think he's doing a great job. And oh, we also published his book. It's, a, <laughs> it's also a way to show the support. Uh, but I'm also a bit like, well, let's see what happens. Let's see the, yeah, the next well, we, experiments. We, we certainly don't intend to end here. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. We don't intend. OK. And because, uh, yes. Uh, uh, regarding what Didier uh, asked about why, uh, because you could like open the information for the whole world, you know, like Didier suggested, uh, open the E5 formula or something like that. And, you know, uh, you know. and re re no, but regarding that, you, you said that you have your, uh, your, you keep your promises, but I, I think it's not just that. Uh, I mean, um, you it's were, not just, it, yeah, it's not just yeah. that, you, you were in a very, uh, uh, very hard situation because you uh, was looking for help in the rejuvenation space and nobody uh, really gave you the, the material conditions until Akshay uh, appeared. So, yes. We can't back on time now. I mean, back on time and help you some years ago. So, uh, yeah. Akshay already helped and he, he took many risks. And the many investor, risks. He invested took, his own personal money and, and, and his friends yeah. are, are, are investors. So, what I would suggest to DDA and everybody in the rejuvenation field is that we work with what we have, the actual situation. We can't change the past. So, now what we have, we have uh, Harold and Akshay working together with investors and uh, many great inventions in humanity happens with this way, like, uh, I mean, these uh, cell phones, computers, all was made with patents, with companies. Okay, so we need to work with what we have. We can't change the past. So let's help 
in the way we can. So everybody, Didier is helping uh, us, me and Nina, we are helping, but we help uh, in the way we can because we can't change the past. So that's, it's, uh, that's the comment I would like to, to make. One example here, one example mm. from the field of flight. The Wright brothers are famous for having flown first in December 1903, but they were generally disbelieved or widely disbelieved until they put on public uh, flying exhibitions in Paris and in uh, America in when? 1908. So they went in a period of five years in which they were not uh, widely believed. The uh, newspaper headline said, well, have the rights flown or have they not flown? After all, there was this photo, but people said, well, it's just bouncing along the beach, you know, a bit like the Maharishis sometimes seem to be flying in meditation, but actually they're just bouncing off the cushions. The reason the rights uh, were slow is they were doing exactly what Harold is doing now. They were securing patents and securing legal agreements, securing uh, customer relations. So they talked a lot about what they were doing. They did uh, discuss, but uh, their final vindication had to wait until patents were in place. So I hope it doesn't take five years in this case. I hope it can be done more quickly. But in any case, something else might uh, make people pay more attention, and that is the results of your ongoing test in terms of how long might some of these rats live? Because I understand that the rats of the species, generally the maximum uh, recorded lifespan is somewhere about four years. Other yeah. rats from other species may have lived longer in some, but this particular species, I forget the name. So uh, how old are the rats now and how long would we have to wait? If, uh, the sprig dolly rats, they're only about 32 years old. So we're gonna have to wait for more than a year to, but uh, during that time, we're talking about maximum length. During that time, we expect the old, God, I don't want to hope for death for, for any of these poor rats. We hope that the old controls die while the treated rats remain alive, and that'll be a, a good indication that we're, we're heading to, towards the, uh, the ultimate prize, which is uh, immortal youth. So in a moment, I'm going to close down this uh, formal part of the session. Uh, just for people still watching, uh, almost all of the audience is still here, so that's very encouraging. Uh, I'm going to let you have a chance, Harold, to make some closing remarks. If there's something you feel deserves to be emphasized again, then you can do that. And then I will break for 10 minutes. I will shut down the recording. I will shut off the cameras. And then if people do want to come back, uh, a few of us will still be here and we can continue to discuss in a, in a more informal way. And people who have been asking me, uh, could they raise a question by audio? Uh, I will give them a chance to do that now. So whether Harold and Nicholas and uh, Na, uh, Nina are still here, it depends on their schedule. They've already given a lot of their time. But I, I want to thank you, Harold. You've given a great deal for people to think about, and uh, it's only the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more in your book, which uh, is not the book that may be for everybody's liking, because you are discursive. You look at multiple uh, lines of science and philosophy and history, which I personally love, because I think all of that's important. Other thank people you. may just want to skip to the end, where you give the, a very powerful summary of the data so far. But mm -hmm. uh, what would you like to say in conclusion of this uh, part of the meeting, Harold. Uh, my, my hope is that this will be an evolutionary change in mankind for, for the better, that people will no longer look at the future as, as something to hand on to their uh, imaginary grandchildren, descendants, but as their own future, <laughs> and will take care of the earth. People will be less likely to throw away their lives and the in the useless ego struggles of dictators who, who when their lives could, could be so productive and last so long. Uh, and, and my real reason, my real reason for, for even thinking about, because I personally uh, don't think life is all that wonderful. It is wonderful, but... Uh, my really reason for wanting to extend it is that it allows human beings to, to, to have a galactic civilization, to reach the stars, because the speed of light is, is, is still 
in spite of those UAPs that the, the Air Force talks about, the speed of light is to our knowledge still the limiting, uh, the limiting um, velocity in the universe and it takes uh, years or decades to reach the nearest the habitable stars. So this changes everything. Yeah, uh, I think it's it not does. just a small matter. Oh, uh, a little bit different in this weird part of life. No, this uh, will change philosophy, change religion, change society. And when people find out that it's for real, rather than just a pipe dream, they'll stop doing what they're doing. They'll stop uh, being distracted. And uh, I think there'll be a much quicker change, almost a singularity in human experience. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to host you. And thanks also to Nicholas and uh, Nina for uh, joining in. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.